on this episode of Launch Stories. We didn't know much at all about this whole new world of startups and investors. We only knew that we wanted to uh, build a global company. We wanted to make a lot of money. We wanted this whole, uh, you know, fireworks with it. And um, we read an article about the best startups and investors in Europe. And Seedcamp was the best. It was on the top of the list, you know. So we Mm -hmm. thought that if you want to apply for investment, then we should go to them. Welcome to Launch Stories, the global startup podcast. I'm your host, Zoltan Vardy. The Launch Stories podcast gives you a taste of what it takes to launch a global startup. Listen to founders share their personal ups and downs, their professional wins and losses, and the lessons they've learned along the way to building an international company. You'll also hear from accelerators and investors that support entrepreneurs along their journey around the world and what they think is the recipe for startup success. So join me on Launch Stories, get inspired and learn the ingredients of a successful global business. My guests today are Zhuja and Attila Ketchmar. They are a husband and wife team who are also co-founders of Antavo, a software as a service marketing tool that works with brands and retailers to build loyalty programs. The company was founded 10 years ago by four Hungarians in London. Today, Antavo provides their loyalty management platform to global clients like BMW, Lagardère, Benetton, and Brewdog. With a presence across multiple countries in Europe and Asia Pacific, Antavo has grown into a truly global business. Let's listen to their launch story. Zhuzha and Attila, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having us. Absolutely, it's a pleasure. Let's not be shy. We've known each other for over 10 years. In fact, I believe I followed your progress both on a personal and a professional level uh, as both entrepreneurs and as Antavo, the company, for quite a few years. Zhuzha, I thought it would be interesting um, If you could just reflect a little bit on the journey you've been on in the last 10 years and maybe even reflect on what you just heard in the introduction to what Antavo has become, what would you tell your 23-year-old self about what it takes to build a a global startup? Well, your introduction was very nice to hear because indeed it was a long journey for us and it always feels that it's just still the beginning. But what if what what I would tell to my 23-year-old self? Well, uh, you know, there is this saying that Things take usually double the time than you expect, but I think it's not true. It takes even more than that. It may take like five times or four times more than you would expect. So it, it was a long journey for us. And uh, we found that, well, in two, three years, we would like, you know, exit the company and then move to the next chapter. But then we realized that there is so much more in this this particular company that we need to think of, work on, and build it uh, till the next stages. And what I also learned and what I would tell to my 23-year-old self is that there is no state of knowing. So there will never be a time when you know how to do things, you will always be unsure. I think I'm not alone with this, that I Google things still today about how Mm -hmm. to do things. Would you talk your 23-year-old self out of getting involved in the whole journey? Oh, not at all. And I think it's very useful for 20-somethings to start a business because they don't know what is ahead of them. And I think older people or people in their 30s, 40s, they know too much and it makes it harder (laughs) to start a business. They know what they're getting themselves into. Sometimes it's nice not to know that. So Attila, I believe the original idea for what became eventually Antavo was yours. Could you talk a little bit about what that was and and how you progressed into what you are today? The thing what we started back in 2005, actually not in 2005, but uh, rather 2009, we started uh, with a quite different product. At first, it, this, it was a CRM system, and then we pivoted to a social platform. Not social, but definitely a tool uh, for small businesses who can run uh, contests and other type of activities on, on social channels. And then uh, we pivoted again around five, six years ago to look at this space. So we started with a quite different solution for quite different market for quite different type of clients and size of clients as well. Pivoting is something you've mentioned a couple of times. It's a common thing in the startup world, right? It's the process whereby you take your core business idea and you reposition it to a new market segment or sometimes even rethink the entire business. 
you've done it quite a few times over the last 10, 12 years. Can you describe the process you go through in your mind to get to the point where you say, we've got to pivot, we've got to do something differently? First of all, there are two uh, outcomes. The first is if the company just realized that the, uh, the business, what they are doing doesn't work, then they just simply change the business. This is one or outcome. And the other one is when the business or the team would like to continue and they really would like to figure out what they need to do in order to you know, build a real business which works, then this is the path that we took back then. We were in a quite bad situation around 2014. We had a very high churn, like uh, 30% monthly, mm -hmm. meaning that you know we lost basically the whole, the whole entire customer base in, in one quarter. And then we, we felt it, well, this business is, that just doesn't go in the right direction. And that's why we, we felt it, we need to change. And uh, we wanted to keep the team together. Then we just uh, simply uh, felt it gamification as a next step because we already started to do something like this uh, with the previous product before Pivot. And then we continued the journey with gamification. And then we also had a couple of small pivots after that as well. How do you know at that point where you're losing basically 100% of your customers every quarter not to just give up? and just say, you know what, we've done our best. This is as far as we could take it. What is it that keeps you in the game? Many things. One of the most important one is, um, you know, endurance and uh, also seed camp. So we got investment from seed camp back in, back in the days, back in 2005. We just didn't want to uh, give it up. So you felt you owed seed camp this commitment to try to find the path to success? Uh, seed camp was your first investment it was a small investment as a, as a seed investor um you then went on to raise a larger amount of money describe the circumstances that led you to uh, introducing your first institutional round of investment and how it changed the game for you as a company and you personally we didn't know much at all about this whole new world of startups and investors we only knew that we wanted to uh, build a global company. We wanted to make a lot of money. We wanted this whole, uh, you know, fireworks with it. And um, we read an article about the best startups and investors in Europe. And Seedcamp was the best. It was on the top of the list, you know. So mm -hmm. we thought that if you want to apply for investment, then we should go to them. We uh, applied to their events because back then Seedcamp did events and the first we didn't get in in 2011 but in 2012 we were very lucky well you know about luck if you prepared you are lucky we were very much prepared and then also we were lucky because we had this great growth in signups it was a technology change in one of the social platforms that we were working with and we were just in the right time to introduce our numbers it was an exponential growth and Sitcam decided to invest in us. So out of the 100 companies who applied, 10 they invited and they invested in two of us. The other company died, I think, next year. That's the investment game, right? Sometimes you invest in a company that dies. Sometimes you invest in UiPath, which is one of the seed cap investments, which just went public in uh, the United States at a valuation of something like $30 billion. So you have both, both paths in front of you. What I'd be really interested in, in learning is when you got the investment, how did that change your approach? How did that change your mentality? Uh, did it change your mentality? And if so, you know, how did you deal with that situation? I think it changed many things. So after we got the investment, I can just also echo what Attila said, that we became the part of that. those Seedcamp founders who have this badge that, okay, now you are a Seedcamp founder. And it made us not to give up. Um, also, it brought us to a mindset, which was, I don't think, quite good, uh, because it can very much focus on raising the next round. And um, a lot of conversations were going on, preparing to next investment pitches and investor relations and so on. But at that point, what we should have done is to focus on our product. And um, we should have... Uh, sat down more and work with our colleagues. And actually, when we ran out of money in that year, in 2012, and moved home with basically nothing in our pockets as founders, in 2013, we had a great growth because instead of networking, we started working. Okay. There is a saying that it's just one letter difference between networking huh. and not working. Yeah. Well, you said you left 
or went home with nothing in your pockets as founders. You know, it's interesting from the outside, if you um, if you say that you're part of a startup or you're, you're building a company, it can seem quite glamorous, right? You're on the, you know, the edge of innovation, the edge of technology, um, you're your own boss, you know, you can do whatever you want. That's kind of this image from the outside. But when you get inside this sort of bubble of entrepreneurship, it's it's much more of a struggle, isn't it? I remember that when uh, we got the investment from Seedcamp, that was 50k uh, back in the days. We felt it, it is endless money. We can develop anything uh, <laughs> uh, with this money. Well, uh, then we moved to U UK and our rent cost and everything else was just uh, insanely expensive compared to what we had uh, back in Hungary. So basically, um, we couldn't give us salary, just the very minimum. And um, we didn't have that much money. That's why we, whenever we needed to buy something from you know, the grocery store, we bought it as bulk. In a huge case. It was a huge yes, case with wheels. wheels. <laughs> and because, you know, it was uh, cheaper, the transportation cost. Right, right. So, so you're that, looking for logistic savings there, yeah. I guess. Uh huh. And, and was there ever a time when you felt that it was too much? Did you ever have that, that sense along the, this way? We felt it a couple of times, usually for a day. And what happens during that day and what happens after the day? During the day, it's painful, tough. I felt it a couple of times already uh, since then as well. I'm usually not that productive uh, on that day. And then the next day, I just came back to the game. <laughs> Come back to the game. I often compare it to riding on a roller coaster, right? You're on this roller coaster, you know you're preparing for an adventure ahead. And, you know, there's that moment when you're climbing up that first big hill and you sort of feel like you're developing in the right direction and you hit the peak. And then all of a sudden you start plummeting down into the depths without understanding what's happening next. But there are those ups and downs and, and sort of they tend to, to balance each other out. What was that moment where you felt like we really have got something here? We feel like we're going to get through this difficult patch and, and build something that matters? Uh, I think the last time that uh, we felt it, it was like a year ago. So basically in year nine. Um, and then it is thanks to this new situation uh, that the pandemic presented to us. Uh, the pandemic really accelerated uh, the digital transformation all over the world. And there are many retailers and brands who are running ahead and uh, taking on these digital transformation projects. It really helps our business too. And if we see our competitors, if we see consultants working in the space or even Gartner and Prester analysts that we are talking to, that's the same thing. There is just a boom in our industry and we can now enjoy it and we need to grow with the boom. So, um, so our clients choose us, the prospects choose us and come with us on this journey. It happened around a year ago. And what about the first nine years? Were there moments where you felt like you had stumbled onto something? There were many, especially with these little bursts of success. There are so many because without them, you can't keep going, really. Uh, we basically, basically, with the first product that uh, we were building between 2011 and 2015-16, it was uh, a lead generation tool for small businesses. Eventually, uh, we reached like 30,000 marketeers all over the world who have ever used the platform. And it's a nice number. So we really um, always thought that, yes, these customers are leaving, but they are coming back. And we thought that with a marketing machine, then we can make it work. Eventually, I'm so happy that we changed from that space. But it was also a small reassurance that we can make things work. Let's shift gears for a moment. Um I don't get to ask this very often, but so I have to take this opportunity now. Uh, what is it like to build a business as a husband and wife team? Uh, can you separate your personal relationship uh, from your professional one? Or in fact, do you even need to separate it in order to be successful? My parents, they do the same, actually. So it's what I saw when I was uh, younger and growing up. It works well. Obviously, there are lots of challenges uh, everywhere, you know, uh, with the business. Sometimes with you know relationship as well, but this is this is normal, I guess. And Jujra, have you seen that uh, that relationship evolve, that professional personal relationship within the context of Antavo in the last ten years? Well, I think um, it definitely evolved as the business evolved, and there are more people involved now. I think what we had at the beginning still exists; that our skills complement each other very well. 
and why we trust each other's expertise. And it's not only in our relationship, in our marriage, or in our uh, relationship as business partners, but also the co-founding team itself. Um, the co-founding team has a very complementary skill set, and it was very great from the beginning that we could rely on each other's expertise. And what does it take to build a successful startup team? I mean, you mentioned, obviously, you've got co-founders as well. Um, are there certain things that you consider to be essential to build a successful entrepreneurial uh, team or organization? I think uh, one of the key components is uh, endurance. So you need to believe in something and you need to put a lot of uh, enormous energy in it and resource in it. Uh, and this is what we did. You know, we once, uh, the last time when we uh, did this pivot uh, to loyalty space, uh, we didn't know too much about uh, this vertical. But what we did is we started to dig in, put lots of resources in it, started to learn about it, started to develop a product around it or for this market. And then fast forward, you know, five years, um, Gartner Forest is uh, featuring us. And were there skills that you had to acquire from the market that you think would have been better to have been part of the, the original founding team? You know, in this kind of businesses, the knowledge, you know, the... The expertise is definitely key, key component. So if we have it, then would have been, you know, part of the thing, then we would have been, you know, um, growing faster or, you know, reaching its point uh, faster. What about as a leader of an organization, Attila, you are the CEO of the company. How have you had to evolve as a leader and a manager as the company itself has grown? It's a great question. I think my skills evolved a lot since the beginning. At first, you know, when we, we were a team of, like six people i was rather a developer back then and then uh since we are more than a team of 60 i'm not you know, touching anything uh, from the engineering at all i think there's a big difference between team size of 20 between 60. these days we have a quite strong management leadership team and these days we have you know separated uh, expertise colleagues people on uh, different fields obviously my job and role and activities evolved a lot i don't you know need to manage those parts i need to manage the people and uh, i need to you know uh, set the strategy the vision and um, the money and the people the key hires this is my you know main responsibilities Juju, your role has evolved or changed a couple of times over the last six years can you talk about how what roles you had and how your responsibilities and impact on the company evolved over this time? I started as the marketing person at the company and I was such a beginner that I even wrote my thesis about the business plan of Antavo. Um, it changed like a thousand times since then, of course. And I got a four on a scale of five, so not even the best grades, but anyway, it's just a <laughs> nice little story. And then back then, uh, basically there were two sides of the company, the, like the business side and the technical side. And I did so many things on the business side, even pitching to investors. So with the first one, two investment rounds, I was the one who was pitching in front of uh, investors. Uh, but marketing was always my field. Uh, back then it was a broader field involving dealing with the customers and sales too, but now it's really focusing on marketing. Uh, from being a hands-off marketing professional, now I'm more of a leader, managing marketing managers and partnership managers. How has your team accepted this change in role, right? I mean, there's that heroic early stage of any startup, right? Where you're there with everybody and you're playing football at two in the morning and you're grabbing beers at night and you're in this together. And there's this point at which you start separating, right? From the day-to-day -day opportunities. Is it difficult for startup team members to accept that? I think it's a natural process. It's a natural process that people uh, get better at things. They do, they start to do other things within the organization and people get older too. So uh, previously we really hired many times uh, people just out of the university. And these days we rarely do that. We work with experts who already bring the expertise from a different company that they were before. Uh, and I see great, great stories among our colleagues. So one of them started with us as a tester and he became a developer, then eventually like a head of product engineering. Now he's a solution consultant. So he's one of really the strongest people 
uh, within the organization. The other one started as a marketing assistant, become a marketing manager, and then a loyalty strategist, and then a customer success manager. Now she is a business analyst. So that's great to see the progression within the team. Exactly. And we have like two, three, four colleagues like this who are with us for like seven years and they grow with the company. Tell me about what Ontavo is today as a business and where you see yourself in three years. Ontavo is a loyalty management platform for enterprise, meaning that we help our clients to run, build and run a loyalty program successfully. So we have technology platform. They can utilize uh, its capabilities. And these days, we already serving many clients from anywhere from the globe. Meaning that we reach a certain point when we consider ourselves as a global vendor, still uh, in early phase uh, in this global game. But um, definitely we made or reached some great milestones. In three years time, uh, we want to continue it and uh, definitely want to take a much bigger share of its uh, you know, uh, pie uh, in the future, meaning that we would like to establish more offices globally, including South American region, more in uh, APAC region, which is very much growing rapidly. And there's a new trend. It's called low code or low code. Mm -hmm. And it's very important in loyalty field as well, meaning that you as a client, you don't need to spend that much time on integration. Uh, with third party, and you can uh, speed up the process, you can iterate faster, go to market easier or faster, and the TCO is usually lower. So it's, it's a new trend, and we put already a lot of resources in it. So we have a slight bridge. So you say you're a global vendor with ambitions of presence in Latin America. What challenges do you face being such a global business? We have lots of challenges. One of the biggest ones is, you know, uh, it's an enterprise game, meaning that our clients are big organizations and they require lots of services from them, not just technology, meaning that customer support, project management, product expert capabilities, uh, you know, implement the product work together with the big system integrators, the big four. And for that, um, we need much more resource. And this is one of the biggest challenge for us, but not for us. This is the experience for anyone else, you know, find good, great talents. You know, if you receive or experience that intense growth in terms of company growth, then uh, you also need to hire much faster, but it's it's challenging. So plenty of things to worry about, which I'm sure you'll be able to address and take on as you continue your, your development in this next phase of the company's life. Zhuzha, as just as a closing question, what would you advise to other early stage business owners about what they can expect from building a company? What, what are those, let's say three things that you would recommend that they keep uh, in mind as they start on this journey? So that's the first thing that maybe you could start and decide or start on your own and take investment only if you figured out the basics. The second is that it will be longer than you expect uh, it would take to make it succeed because it's just always longer. So you better to prepare for a marathon rather than a, sp rather than a sprint. And um, maybe the third is that get ready to be behind your peers, um, to see your peers climbing the corporate ladder and doing very well, because you still need to stick to your dream if you believe in your dream and, uh, and, and go for it. Maybe your grandmother will ask several times for years, and when <laughs> will you get a real job? But you still, you know, you can keep going. Well, good advice from people who have gone through this uh, experience themselves. I want to thank uh, you, Zhuzha and Attila, for sharing your line story with us. It was great hearing your journey and uh, felt a bit of nostalgia uh, thinking back over the last 11 years. Thank you all for joining me on Line Stories, the Global Startup Podcast. I hope you were inspired by Zhuzha and Attila's entrepreneurial journey and heard one or two things that will help you cook up your own successful global business. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, leave a review, and share it with your friends.